Political Economy and Its Future. Uh, this course has two themes, uh, a foreground theme and a background theme. The foreground theme is the alternative futures of the market economy, the alternative ways of organizing a market order. And the background theme is the alternative futures of economics itself, of the study of the economy. They're obviously very closely connected. The starting point for the exploration of the foreground theme is the critique of the thesis that might be called market fundamentalism. The thesis of market fundamentalism is that there is a single natural and necessary way of organizing the market economy. So if Robinson Crusoe traded on his island long enough, he would eventually reproduce the institutions of 19th century German private law, the forms of contract and of property. This is the thesis of market fundamentalism. I've stated it just now in an exaggerated form just to bring out its specific character. That the activity of exchange among free and equal economic agents has implicit in it a particular legal and institutional architecture. And that reiterated economic activity will reveal that structure. Now, this might seem at first to be a preposterous thesis, but it is a thesis that played a central role from the 19th century onward in classical legal economic thought in classical legal thought, as well as in economic theory. Now, how do we begin the criticism of this thesis? We can begin with examining the building blocks of the market for the jurist, property and contract. So the thesis of market, fundamentally, market fundamentalism characteristically relies on the unified idea of property. Property is a single right, bringing together all of the component powers of the owner and vesting them in the same right holder. And indeed, for classical legal theory, property was not just one right among others, it was the exemplary form of any right. Now, the unification of the component powers of property in a single right, and their vesting in a single right holder, the owner, is in fact an anomaly in the history of law. In most legal systems, at most times throughout world history, the characteristic form of property has been its disaggregation. The different component powers of property have been broken up and vested in different right holders who are then the claimants to fragmentary or derivative forms of what would be unified property. So this disaggregated form of property has been historically the normal form of property. And the unification of the component elements of property in a single right has been the exception. So for a civil lawyer, for example, in the civil law tradition, he would think the fundamental powers of property are use, 
the use of the asset, usufruct, the claim to an income stream, and alienation, the right to buy and sell. And it is not to be assumed that all of these powers go together and are vested in the same right holder. So to take a familiar historical example, feudalism in the West was based on the disaggregation of the property right and the vesting of its component powers in different right holders. But to take a contemporary example, financial markets are in large part markets in financial derivatives, and they are called derivatives because their object, options, for example, puts and calls, are fragmentary forms of the unified property right. Now, similarly with contract, we think today in the aftermath of 19th century classical legal thought that the exemplary form of contract is the bilateral executory promise. A promise among individual, between individual economic agents to exchange performances at some instantaneous moment in the future. And a promise that is fully bargained out. So it's an arm's length deal between the makers of the contract to do something particular in the future and the performance fully exhausts the deal. But of course, this is not the normal form of contract by any means. And in all societies and economies, a much more characteristic form of contract has been what you could call the relational contract. An ongoing set of exchanges among the parties to the contract in which the main object is not any particular performance, but the development of the relation itself over time, which is instantiated in the particular exchanges that take place. It is not arm's length. It is dependent on a collaboration. The contract is the primitive form the relational contract of a joint venture. And the particular exchanges are in the service of the development of the relationship. And moreover, it is characteristically not fully bargained out. It is an incomplete contract. For the formal law of bilateral executory promises, any form of incompleteness threatens the validity of the deal. But for the relational contract, incompleteness is the very nature of the transaction. A law of the market that is dominated by the model, by the paradigm of the bilateral executory promise We'll imagine the market order as an order that is based on a low level of trust among the economic agents. So this was a theme of classical European social theory in the hands of theorists like Max Weber and Georg Simmel. In traditional societies, they said, the insiders got everything. The outsiders got nothing. And a market order only became possible when a modicum of trust, of low trust, was generalized among strangers. So that leads to a way of thinking about what a market order is. According to this way of thinking, a market order is a form of simplified cooperation among strangers. 
that is impossible when there is no trust and unnecessary when there is high trust. It is a form of market order based on the generalization among strangers of a low level of trust. So a market order that is based on a higher level of trust and that therefore relies on incomplete relational deals is a different kind of market order. So here we're looking at the antithesis to the thesis of market fundamentalism from the top down with, as it were, a telescope. Not from the bottom up, as I will later try to do, in a particular historical circumstance. And we could continue this procedure, which I had begun by addressing the elementary legal building blocks of the idea of the market, property, and contract, with a programmatic speculation, a thought experiment. Let's imagine a completely different kind of market order. But before doing this, let's begin with a conceptual clarification that will help demonstrate what is perplexing about the idea of a market. Take the idea of the market order to the highest level of abstraction. At that highest level of abstraction, it has two characteristics. One characteristic is economic decentralization, the absolute level of economic decentralization. Among economic agents who are able, able to bargain on their own initiative and for their own account. So that's part of what we mean by a market order. There must be a high level of decentralization among this, these independently bargaining economic agents who, as I say, bargain not just on their own initiative but for their own account. But there is a second attribute in the idea of the market that is presupposed by the thesis of market fundamentalism. The second attribute has to do with the absoluteness of the control that each of those independent agents enjoys over the resources at his command. So absolute in time, uh, in the sense that he can alienate, he can transmit through, through inheritance, but absolute also in power because the property right unifies all the component elements of property. Now, in the thesis of market fundamentalism, these two dimensions of the abstract idea of the market, the dimension of absolute decentralization and the dimension of absolute control are thought to go naturally and necessarily together. They are inseparable. But in fact, not only are they not inseparable, but in a sense they contradict each other for the following reason. You could say that one way in which you could hope to increase the absolute amount of economic decentralization, the number of economic agents able to bargain on their own initiative and for their own account, would be to limit the absoluteness of the control that each of them enjoys. The unification of the powers or the preservation in time of the right. So you could imagine property rights that would be fragmentary, conditional, or temporary. And these claims to assets, to productive resources and opportunities that were fragmentary, temporary, or relative would make it possible for you 
to increase the amount of economic decentralization. So it's not obvious that the two dimensions of this idea, in fact, go naturally and necessarily together. Maybe they are not only separable, but contradictory. Now, with this idea in mind of their possible discontinuity, their contradiction, I come to the thought experiment that I had in mind, which, of course, could not be instituted in any real economy any time in the foreseeable future. It's a, it's a radical idea. Now, the idea is this. All of the productive assets of society are vested in independent trusts, not in the state, in the central government, which would have allocational authority over these assets, but independent social trusts. And these trusts are managed uh, by representatives who are chosen for their professional competence and ultimately vested by the democratic institution. And these trusts, under different schedules of investment, different levels of acceptance of risk, different time horizons, different tolerances for volatility, conduct a rotating capital auction. So, in principle, whoever is able to assure the trust the highest rate of return for those productive assets gets to use them until some other team of entrepreneurs and workers can bid those assets away and assure the trust of a higher rate of return. And of course, there would be a multitude of practical problems in the implementation of such an idea. So what would this be, this programmatic experiment that I de just described to you? Would this not be a market economy? It would be. It would be a radicalization of the idea of economic decentralization. If we were to use Marxist terms, we could say this would be like capitalism without capitalism. That's where it would be. Now, there's something strange in the following way, that actually, if you take the orthodox thinking and the orthodox way of thinking about the capital market, the existing economic order is supposed to be something very close to the speculative system that I just described to you. So, a perfectly functioning, competitive capital market is supposed to be able to allocate resources to their most efficient uses. And according to this orthodox thinking, the assets will ultimately fall into the hands of their most efficient users. The only difference will be the rents or advantages that the asset owners at some prior moment will enjoy because of their temporal priority. But this is regarded as a secondary feature. In the end, it will go, the assets will go to whoever is able to use them most efficiently. Now, that's what's supposed to happen. But of course, we know that's not what happens. And so uh, this thought experiment that I've just described to you shows immediately the implication, the importance of determining what the structure of the market is. So we could say, for example, that one of its aims would be to ensure that what's supposed to happen, that the assets go to the, into the hands of their most efficient users, actually happens. And to do that, we might have to redesign the market order radically. Well, so much for my speculative experiment, looking as it were from the top down. Uh, 
uh, in developing the idea that a market order can take radically different forms. Now let me look from the opposite direction, from the bottom up, with a historical example. Take the United States in the first half of the 19th century, between independence and the Civil War. We all know that there was the terrible background of African slavery. When Tocqueville visited the United States in the 1830s, only one in five white men worked for another white man. It was essentially an economy of artisans, of craftsmen, of small-scale proprietors, of independent economic agents. So everyone, every, everyone in the United States, every man in the United States at that time was either a slave or in principle an independent proprietor. Very few people were wage laborers. Now, in this circumstance, the country built itself. And how did it build itself? It built itself by a method that the perspective of market fundamentalism has trouble acknowledging or understanding. So there were two movements. On top, in the national government, there was a national developmental project. The ideologist of national development was Alexander Hamilton. The country was literally built with roads, with canals, later with railroads. Uh, the National Bank was organized as the instrument for this nascent plutocracy. There, were, there was a clique of entrepreneurs, adventurers, politicians, and bureaucrats who oversaw the development of the country, this developmental state. But the United States would not have become what it became if this were the only thing that happened. The developmental project on top converged with the selective democratization of the economy in what were then the two most important sectors of the American economy, agriculture and finance. So take agriculture. The predominant thesis in the world at that time was the thesis of the inevitability of agrarian concentration. The peasants would be driven out of the land as they were in most of Europe and in Britain. Uh, uh, and they would become later factory workers. There would be consolidated land holdings. And this thesis of the conservatives, of the European conservatives, was also the thesis of Marxism. There would be inevitable agrarian concentration to achieve economies of scale as the indispensable predicate to a highly productive agricultural economy with entrepreneurial attributes. Now, what happened is that the Americans rejected this idea. On the agrarian frontier, they distributed the lands through the Homestead Act. And they organized between the central or local government and the farmers what in today's vocabulary we would call decentralized strategic coordination, a partnership. The government established the land-grant colleges that brought science 
to the family farmer and scientifically based technology. They secured agriculture, family scale agriculture, against its unique problem, which is the susceptibility simultaneously to physical risk, climate volatility, and economic risk, price volatility. They organized price supports, food stockpiles, crop insurance, agricultural income insurance, and so forth. And they developed the instrument of agricultural extension, the actual presence of the state in the family farm. Uh, and the result was spectacular. The Americans created the most efficient system of family scale agriculture with entrepreneurial attributes that had ever existed in the world. The second conflict which took place was the conflict over finance. The National Bank had been established by Hamilton and his followers, and it was the instrument for speculation by that elite that developed the, the, the that orchestrated the developmental project that I described to you a moment ago. And there was a conflict over the National Bank. This conflict culminated in the presidency of Andrew Jackson in the dissolution of the second National Bank of the United States. For over a hundred years, the Americans prohibited any bank from operating in more than one state of the union. And they created the most decentralized system of credit at the service of the local producer and not just the local consumer that had ever existed in the world. So these two movements in agriculture and in finance were absolutely decisive for the shape of the early republic. And we cannot understand the making of the United States except when we take into account this relation between the convergent movements from the top down and from the bottom up, the developmental project of the national elite and this selective democratization of the economy in the then two crucial areas of agriculture and finance. Now, the same movement recurred later on in American history, the same combination of developmentalism on top and selective democratization below, but weaker and weaker, weaker at the time of the Civil War and Reconstruction, weaker in the progressive movement. There were spikes later on in American history in which this uh, attempt resurfaced in some form. One of them was the early New Deal, the first year and a half of Roosevelt's New Deal. This is a period of institutional experimentalism based on concerted action between private business and the national government. And even more spectacular, but much less understood was the war economy. In the period between 1942 and 1945, the Americans reorganized their economy radically. They who were supposedly devoted to the sacrosanct dogmas of the market cast the dogmas aside when they needed to, as if they were just a mask. And they organized the economy on a completely different basis through flexible collaboration between government and business, especially at that time, to be sure, big business rather than small business. Massive resource mobilization and radical institutional experimentalism. The result? 
was nothing less than sensational. In between 1942 and 1945, the GDP of the United States doubled. There had never been such a massive experiment in economic growth conducted on the basis of a complete denial of the prevailing economic ideas. Uh, now, of course, what happened was that no one formulated the, the conception of a war economy without a war. And the radical experiments of the war economy were seen as unique experiments adapted to a circumstance that would not recur, not relevant to the organization of the peacetime economy. But the general reason why this combination of selective democratization below and developmentalism on top became weaker and weaker seems to have to do with the combination of two factors. So one factor was the weakness of democratic politics. The Americans in their constitution had organized what you could call a proto-democratic liberalism that filtered out or limited popular influence. And the constitution was the object of a cult. It was revered. And the second element was the weakness of thought. So what the Americans did when they reorganized finance and agriculture in the way that I have just described was to reinvent the market order in agriculture and in finance. What were they doing? They weren't regulating the agricultural and the financial markets. And they weren't attenuating the inequalities generated in the market by retrospective tax and transfer. They were innovating in the legal and institutional architecture of the market economy. They were creating a different kind of market in those two sectors. But they never made explicit, they never generalized the idea. They never saw those two particular interventions as species of a general project, the project of democratizing the market order by changing its legal and institutional apparatus. And if you look today at policy and social science, it just continued, this suppression of the structural imagination, as you all know, if you study at Harvard University. Uh, so uh, that's presenting the same idea as it were from the bottom up, the idea that the market can take alternative forms. Now, what I intend to do in the argument of this course is to develop this critique of the thesis of market fundamentalism and to apply it to three sets of problems, three sets of contemporary problems that I see as decisive for the fate of the market economy. The first is the relation of the vanguard to the rest of the economy, of the advanced part of production to the backward parts of production, the vanguard and the rear guard. The second is the relation of finance to production or to the real economy. And the third is the relation of labor to capital. Now, by way of anticipation, 
Let me just say a word about each of these products. So first, the vanguard and the rearguard. In every historical circumstance, there is a most advanced practice of production. Uh, in the past, the most advanced practice of production was mechanized manufacture, or what was later called Fordist mass production. The production of the large-scale production of standardized goods and services by relatively rigid machines and production processes on the basis of semi-skilled labor in very hierarchical and specialized relations of production. That used to be the most advanced practice of production. And it was therefore the object of intense study by the greatest economists in the history of economic thought, Adam Smith and Karl Marx. They both believed that the best way to understand the workings of the economy and its possible future was to study the most advanced practice of production in the historical epoch. Because the most advanced practice of production is the, is the practice that most fully reveals our powers. Now the most advanced practice of production is something else, the, what we call the knowledge economy or the innovation economy. And it is not to be confused simply with advanced manufacture. It exists in every sector of the economy, in intellectually dense services and in precision or scientific agriculture, as well as in advanced manufacture. It's often identified in the popular mind with the tech, with the platform oligopoly. But they're actually an anomaly. We'll discuss them later in a different context. But uh, they depend on a, 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 a special collection of presuppositions. The knowledge economy in its true form is multi-sectoral. But in every sector, it appears today as a fringe excluding the vast majority of workers and of firms. This is a momentous event, because what it means is that the most advanced practice of production is denied to the vast majority of the labor force and, indeed, the vast majority of firms. And if we deny the most advanced practice to the vast majority, how could we not expect there to be economic slowdown? That's one major consequence of this insular character of the knowledge vanguard, of the new vanguard of production, economic stagnation. For a long time, the United States has had no strategy of economic growth. The only strategy of economic growth can be summarized in two words, cheap money. And it is implemented not by the national government, but by the central bank, the Federal Reserve. So a strategy of national growth that would be on a level with the strategy that the Americans adapted in the early 19th century for agriculture and finance would have to find a way to deepen and disseminate the knowledge economy, to carry this advanced practice of production to the whole production system. And that might require not just a revolution in the character of education, but also 
a set of institutional innovations in the organization of the market order. Now, the second theme is the theme of finance and the real economy. So finance has become bloated. There is financial hypertrophy. But to a very large extent, it seems that the transactions of the real economy and the productive agenda of society are more the pretext for successive layers of financial engineering. So there is financial hypertrophy without financial deepening. A reasonable assumption would be that the best way to make finance less dangerous, less productive of crisis, is to make it more useful, to tighten the links between the capital markets and the productive agenda of society. And how are we to do that, then, is the question. Now, the third theme, the third focal point, then, is the relation of labor to capital. There is an emergency problem now in the contemporary world. The problem is that an increasing part of the labor force is consigned to insecure employment, precarious employment, without stable, good jobs. Downward tilt to the returns to labor is then an incubus, a burden on inclusive innovation. There can't be innovation in a slave economy. And there's going to be less innovation in an economy in which labor can be bought or sold cheaply and is rendered radically insecure under the pretext of being made flexible. Uh, and the result has been the subversion of the historical basis of the progressive parties in the West, of the left-leaning parties, which was, was the organized industrial labor force headquartered in the capital-intensive sectors of the economy. So there's the urgent problem of precarious labor. Then there's the problem of the evolution of technology. So technology has no independent or automatic dynamic. It doesn't necessarily evolve in one direction or another. It will always, to some extent, replace labor. But the question is, to what extent can it also be made to enhance labor? And the ultimate idea is very simple. Everything that we have learned how to repeat we can express in a formula or in an algorithm. And we can then embody the formula or the algorithm in a mechanical device, the machine. What then is the point of the machine? The point of the machine is to do for us what we have learned already how to repeat so that we can preserve our supreme resource, our time, for what we have not yet learned to repeat. And then the combination of the worker and the machine, the worker as the anti-machine and the machine, will be immensely more powerful than either of them alone. So under what conditions can the evolution of technology go in this direction? That it empowers and enhances labor 
rather than simply replacing it. Now, then we get to the question of the status of free labor. So, we now think that wage labor is the natural form of free labor. But up to the middle of the 19th century, no one thought that. The general view shared by liberals and socialists was that wage labor was a defective and transitory form of free labor, returning, retaining many of the characteristics of serfdom and slavery. The higher forms of free labor were self-employment and cooperation. So, for example, if you read Abraham Lincoln's address to the, to, to the Wisconsin Agricultural Society a few years before the Civil War, he says, no free man would voluntarily choose to be a wage laborer except by folly or extreme recklessness. So the idea was this defective form of labor wage labor would give way to the higher forms. But of course, things didn't develop that way. And economically coerced wage labor became the predominant form of free labor. The liberals and socialists in the 19th century were never able to solve a problem. The problem was to show how the predominance of self-employment and cooperation could be reconciled with the relentless imperative of economies of scale. And they weren't able to do that because they assumed the traditional system of property rights, which I described to you before in that speculative experiment. So there would have to be an economic system in which Access to productive resources and opportunities would be radically decentralized. And we would create many forms of temporary or conditional claims on the productive resources of society. Now, there would always be a role for the unified property right. Frank Knight, a conservative economist of the Chicago School, said, the historical justification of capitalism is the existence of a class of people who are willing to pay a premium for the privilege of running a risk. So that traditional, archaic, unified property right has a tremendous advantage. The advantage is that it allows someone, the owner, the absolute owner, to do something at his own risk that no one else believes in. And so we would always want there to be a space in the economic order for the unified property right so that that function could be served. But it shouldn't be the only way in which we organize economic decentralization. It should just be one way. The market economy should not be nailed to the cross of a single dogmatic version of itself. So this is how I propose in the course to explore the theme of the alternative futures of the market, by discussing it chiefly in these three contexts, vanguard and rearguard, finance and production, and labor and capital. Now, the background theme of the course is the theme of the alternative futures of economics itself. And we all know what the familiar critiques of economics are. They're not taken seriously by the economists. 
So here's the problem. Uh, economics is not the study of the economy. Economics, as it's organized today and conducted, for example, in the economics departments of the leading American research universities, which are hegemonic in the global organization of the discipline, is the study of a method. It's the study of a method pioneered by the so-called marginalist theoreticians at the end of the 19th century. Jevons, Menger, Vala. It's the study of that method. And the application of that method to subjects that don't seem to be economics is regarded as economics. And the study of the economy by some other method, like for example, Max Weber's studies of the economy are considered not to be economics. Well, this doesn't make any sense, but this is, but this is how it's thought in the university. And that's because the whole university culture is based on the forced marriage of methods to subject matters. So, for example, evolutionary biology is studied by a historical method. But fundamental physics is studied by an anti-historical or structural method. Now why? We discovered in the 1920s that the universe has a history, and therefore every part of it must be historical. But the, the spirit of the university culture is this coerced marriage of methods to subject matter. The national curriculums that exist in much of the world uh, represent a kind of infantilization of the orthodoxies of the university culture. So what they try to do is to induce the young to mistake the dominant ideas for the way things are. And they disseminate this conception of the necessity and naturalness of, this, of these marriages of methods and subject matter. As a result, they emasculate the young and deliver them to the higher stages of education prepared for a life of intellectual civility. But of course, we, uh, so we have to imagine as Democrats and as experimentalists, an antidote uh, to this situation, uh, a subject which will come up later in our, in our argument. So what about this method, which is now regarded as economics? So the familiar critique of it is that it makes assumptions that are unrealistic. Uh, rational agents, uh, maximizing choice, and so forth. This makes no sense, because it was never meant to be descriptive. So the economists don't take this critique seriously. The real criticisms of this method are of a completely different order. And I will now uh, uh, briefly anticipate to you uh, what they are. So the first criticism is the separation of causal inquiry or empirical study from formal analysis. In this discipline, there's a great deal of empiricism and a great deal of formal analysis, but they have very little to do with each other. So the way the economist proceeds is by imagining the whole economy as a connected set of markets and examining it from the perspective of the individual agent who is required to maximize the use of scarce resources to operate in a situation of scarcity. 
So the Austrian defenders of marginalism correctly understood that this was never intended to be a causal science. This was a form of logic, a kind of logical inquiry. And the models, that, so The Economist proceeds my, against the background of these assumptions, forming models of particular kinds of economic reality. And if one model does work, doesn't work, he changes the elements of the model or the parameters, the values of the elements, and goes to the next model. At no point does this substitution of models jeopardize the underlying theoretical conception. Because the underlying theoretical conception is not a tendentious or controversial empirical view at all. It's not meant to describe anything. It's just forming a logical conception of maximization. So it can't be disproved by the failure of any particular model. And the result is to cut this vital link between uh, empiricism and formal analysis. So it's uh, the proliferation of models against an invariant theoretical background. The formal analytic apparatus has no causal content, makes no factual stipulations, and has no normative direction. It's just a pure logic machine that operates on the fuel that is supplied to it from outside. And without that fuel, it's impotent. It's empty of content, unless we give it a content. Now, one way to give it a content is to make the move of market fundamentalism to say the, the market has a particular institutional content. Here it is. Another way is to import a causal theory from some other discipline, like psychology, or to make one up on the spot, ad hoc. Now, this situation that I've described, that there's a formal method that has no controversial content helps explain the role that mathematics plays in economics. As you know, uh, economics is a discipline that reveres mathematics and mathematical modeling. But the mathematics that is used in economics would be regarded by a mathematician as toy mathematics. There's no advanced mathematics in economics. And why is that? It's because the only mathematics that is useful in economics is the mathematics that can exhibit deductive reasoning, which in any real science plays an entirely secondary role. So. It's not the use of mathematics as it is, for example, in physics to anticipate alternative causal ideas. Now, the second defect in this economics is its deficit of institutional imagination. So you could, at the outset, distinguish two versions of this economics. There's an agnostic, purely theoretical version that ha makes no institutional assumptions. And in fact, in the middle of the 20th century, there was a debate about whether a command economy, a socialist economy, could be understood through the categories of marginalist economics. And it was demonstrated that it could be. 
no institutional assumptions whatsoever. And then there's another kind of economics, which like the Hayekian economics, the market fundamentalism, does make institutional assumptions. I said, this is what a market order has to be. So what's missing is any apparatus by which we can understand the alternative institutional forms of economic activity and therefore the alternative institutional forms of the market itself. The third defect of this form of economics is that it has no theory of production. It is a theory of exchange. And it views production as a shadowy extension of exchange. If you open an economic textbook and you go to the part about the theory of production, you see that it, there's nothing in it about what we would ordinarily call production, about the different forms of production, the advanced forms or the backward forms. It's about the shape of markets and the substitution of some economic factors for others. And this operation of seeing the world of production as simply an extension of the world of exchange is facilitated by a contingent factor of the economies to which this kind of economics applies. Namely, that in them, labor could be bought and sold. And therefore, there are labor markets which can be studied under the lens of relative prices. So for Adam Smith and Karl Marx, the theory of production was of equal weight to the theory of exchange. But for this economics, the theory of production is really just a shadow of the theory of exchange. Now, the fourth defect is that this is a doctrine of competitive selection in a market that has no theory of the genesis of the diverse material on which the method of competitive selection operates. So let me explain by reference to the so-called neo-Darwinian synthesis in the life sciences. The fecundity of a method of, compa of competitive selection depends in large part on the richness of the material to which the method of competitive selection applies. So in the neo-Darwinian thesis, there's a thesis of competitive selection, Darwinian natural evolution, and then there's a theory of genetic mutation or recombination, accounting for the genesis of the diverse material on which the method of competitive selection applies. Here we have a thesis of competitive selection that has just half of the story. It has the half about competitive selection. Where is the other half? The half about the genesis of the diverse stuff. From the standpoint of pure economic theory, the division of the world into sovereign states, organizing their economies in different ways, is an inconvenience or an inexplicable embarrassment. It just creates more transaction costs. Why shouldn't there be a world state? That would be much more logical because there's no independent value given to the creation of diversity. So here we begin to understand that this apparently purely logical method with no controversial content intended by the marginalist theoreticians of the 19th century to be invulnerable to ideological or causal criticism, in fact, buys its invulnerability at a high price. By cutting this vital dialectic between empirical study and formal analysis, it condemns the discipline to a kind of eternal infancy. 
Now, we have a problem, and the problem is this. We can't dispense with this discipline. It has enormous advantages. All this model building, this analysis of costs, it is the discipline that presents the bill. You want to do this? This is what it costs. This contradicts that. That's what they do. So it presents the bill, and we need someone to present the bill. We need, this is a, a, a precious resource of clarification. So we're not entitled to disregard it, but it's not enough. It's not enough to deal with the problems that interest us. The problems that I just described of the alternative organization of the market economy, the deepening and dissemination of the vanguard, the creation of an inclusive vanguard, uh, the enlistment of finance in the service of the productive agenda of society, and the attempt to make free labor really free in a market economy. That requires a different discipline, and a discipline that doesn't yet exist. So we have to use the existing discipline, but we can't let it determine the limits of the, of the horizon. So that's the background theme. Now, of course, the foreground theme of the alternative forms of the market economy and the background theme very closely connected. If there are alternative forms of the market economy, we need a discipline that is capable of imagining them, of proposing them, of criticizing them, uh, and that does not build into its assumptions the idea of either an empty box in which there are no institutional assumptions, or the wedding of the discipline to a single dogmatic form of the market economy. But I think that the relation between these two themes, the foreground theme and the background theme, are many and subtle. So let me say this. The study of the economy often appeals to people who like money. Uh, but its ultimate concerns are spiritual. In the Hebrew Bible, God says, I will pour out my spirit unto all flesh. The incarnation of spirit in the material life of society is the central subject matter of political economy. And spirit in political economy appears in two forms. It appears as imagination, and it appears as freedom. So as imagination, uh, what is imagination? So for Immanuel Kant, the first move of imagination is distancing from the phenomenon. So an image is the memory of a perception. But the second and crucial move is the subsumption of the actual phenomenon under a range of possible variations. To understand something, you have to be able to understand its transformation. If you don't understand the transformation of the phenomenon, you're, you don't understand it. You're just staring at it. Insight into reality is the imagination of transformation. That's what it is. And so uh, that's the first requirement of the science that we would require. Uh, but there's also this other relation to the phenomenon itself. The more advanced a form of production is, the more mindful it becomes. So the most advanced form of economic life is the one that most clearly embodies the imagination, its ability to create alternatives, to generate alternatives 
physically, imaginatively, that, that, that is the essence of a productive experimentalism. And freedom. So spirit is also freedom. And freedom, but the freedom we want is freedom in the economy and not just freedom from the economy. So Karl Marx and John Maynard Keynes shared two theses. The first thesis is that we are on the verge of overcoming scarcity. And once we overcome scarcity, we will be able to devote ourselves to our private sublimity. Doing poetry and fishing and, and dreaming and so forth. So this is in Keynes's economic possibilities for our grandchildren and in Marx's introduction to the critique of the Gotha program. And the second thesis that they shared in common is that work is a hateful burden, which the overcoming of scarcity will allow us to escape. And there is no form of work that could be different from this, ultimately. Some work is more pleasing and profitable than others. But any work that we need to do is dehumanizing. Now, I think both these ideas are mistaken. We are not on the verge of overcoming scarcity. Scarcity is endlessly reproduced in new forms. But on the other hand, it's not true that work has to be just a hateful burden. We can reimagine the market order. We can reorganize it so that it allows us to achieve freedom in the economy and not just freedom from the economy. Well, that's all I wanted to say by way of introducing the course. And we have time now for your, your comments and questions. Who would like to begin? Yes, you back there. Yes. So this, so the, so in what used to be the most advanced form of production, for this mass production, there was a stark division between the planning of tasks, of productive tasks, and the implementation of productive tasks. Uh, and in this new form, of production, which I'm calling the knowledge economy, there is at least the possibility that this will be relativized. That, so that the, there is not necessarily that stark division between the planning of productive tasks and their execution. So therefore, there is at least the potential for a deconstruction of this strong hierarchical form. Uh, but then there's the question, under what institutional or political conditions can this potential be better realized or not? That's an example of the way in which I want to take an issue like that and examine it in its institutional context. Yes. Well, 
Well, absolutely. So, um, so how do we think? So, there, there. But what is the political context now? The political historical context in which I'm proposing this argument. So, and l l let me be clear about that because I didn't include that in my in my introduction just now. Um, the political context is the failure of the last major institutional ideological settlement in the advanced societies, which was the social democratic or social liberal settlement of the mid 20th century. It was prefigured before the Second World War and fully developed after the Second World War. And you can understand it as a kind of bargain. The bargain was this. The forces that threatened to reshape the worlds of politics and production withdrew this challenge or were forced to withdraw it, to abandon it. And the state was allowed to acquire the power to regulate the economy more intensively to compensate for inequalities generated in the market by retrospective tax and transfer, and to stabilize the economic order through countercyclical fiscal and monetary policy. So the institutional structure was accepted, but then it was to be rendered more efficient and humanized the humanization of the inevitable. Now, what has happened is that we increasingly understand that none of the fundamental problems of the contemporary society can be adequately solved or even addressed within the limits of this social democratic compromise. So example of such a problem is the hierarchical segmentation of the production system between advanced and backward sectors. So the hierarchical segmentation of the production system creates disparities that are so vast between the people who are in the elite sector of advanced production and everyone else who is consigned to some kind of mate work, that these inequalities cannot be addressed through redistributive social spending and progressive taxation. The reason is the following. The reason is that the attempt to correct by retrospective and compensatory redistribution would have to be vast. And long before it reached the requisite dimension to address the inequalities, it would begin to derange the, the economic arrangements and incentives on which production depends. So what happens in reality is that the apparatus of compensatory retrospective redistribution only marginally attenuates the inequalities of these societies. So what's the solution? The solution then is to find a way of organizing the market economy that changes the initial, the primary distribution of economic and educational advantage. That's what should be our target. And not just to establish a secondary distribution that compensates for the defects of the primary distribution. So, then I would say that is one of the aims of the study of the alternative market orders, uh, to, uh, precisely to do that. And I'm not assuming that uh, productivity and economic growth are the sole ends or the ends in themselves. Uh, what I am saying, and taking once again the example of this insular form of the knowledge economy that now prevails, is that 
it imposes two twin evils on the contemporary societies. First, it condemns them to economic slowdown by denying the most advanced practice to the majority. The second is that it, root, it anchors inequality in vast structural divisions between the advanced and backward sectors, which cannot be adequately overcome by compensatory redistribution. So the only adequate response is to imagine some way of deepening and disseminating the more advanced practice, a knowledge economy for the many rather than a knowledge economy for the few. And then we have to ask, under what assumptions is movement in that direction possible? So the ultimate good here if, is, is, is not equality or productivity. The ultimate good here is the generalization of a higher level of agency, that the ordinary man and woman is able to turn the tables on his or her context and to act, to be an agent uh, in economic and political life. If we were to select an ultimate good, that would be it. Yes. I'm just wondering and curious whether you think that um, the sort of initiative of donor A little louder for me to hear up here. All right. I'm just wondering whether you think the um, evolution of donor economics is a derivative of the current methodology or whether it's an indication of a transformation of the discipline. The evolution of which economics? Donor economics. I'm sorry, I didn't get the word. Donor. Oh, donut economics. Yes. Well, you have to tell me a little bit more about what you understand by donut economics. Well, it's a new theory coming out by um, a UK an uh, economist about um, circularizing the economy and pushing resources into one space. And pushing? Resources into one space, and it's more circular. I, I don't know enough about the literature of this idea to, to answer you. But, uh, so we should take this up at, at a different moment. Okay. Yes? Do you have any concerns that in the process of trying to reimagine a new structure for the market that that opens up that given society to any kind of vulnerabilities in the international sphere where those countries who try to maintain a more uh, productive, where productivity is the ultimate good and stick to a more kind of market fundamentalism are able to economically outpace those countries who are trying to innovate and reimagine the economy, which renders it sort of useless because they end up dominating. But why would they dominate? Because they're focusing so much on productivity that they're able to amass a kind of economic power that those countries who are experimenting. But how would they? But are you saying they would they would achieve higher productivity by adhering to the idea of market fundamentalism? Uh, yeah, I'm asking if you think that that is a vulnerability. No, to me that seems paradoxical. I don't understand that. Uh, uh, experimentation uh, and experimentalism are the are the uh, are the gateway to worldly success. Uh, how could they, by adhering to a dogma, achieve this greater success? I I don't understand that. I would go back to this discussion that we were having before with your with your colleague here uh, of understanding the context, the historical context. Historical contexts are the limits that are revealed of the um, social democratic settlement. In the United States, it was the New Deal settlement. And um, so no, I would say none of the fundamental problems of the contemporary societies can be resolved within those limits the problem of social cohesion, the problem of 
transformation, a politics capable of transformation, of experiment, that doesn't depend on crisis as the condition of change. Uh, so n no, no significant problem of the contemporary societies can be solved within the limits of that compromise. So the result is that the majority of these societies feel abandoned or dispossessed as well by the left or progressive parties. And that's what has created this vacuum, which then uh, allows plutocratic populism, right-wing populism, to emerge. Uh, uh, and right-wing populism itself has no productivist project, so it's not really a solution. It, in a way, perpetuates the vacuum rather than overcoming it. So that's, that's, that's what we have seen. Now, internationally, what are the what are the alternatives that we see in the world? We see there is a dictatorship of no alternatives. So the advanced Western societies are uh, receiving these innovations, like the innovations that result in an insular form of the knowledge economy, without deepening and generalizing the, the new forces of production. In the rest of the world, the only alternative is some authoritarian state capitalism. Uh, so, uh, and the world is restless, looking for alternatives. So this is the context. So that's the immediate moment, I would say. The immediate moment is the confrontation with the failures of this social democratic settlement its inability to resolve or address the structural problems of the society. And we're dealing with the economic side of this problem in the course, but in that context. Yes, go on. So does that, you mentioned authoritarian state capitalism. Does that mean that you see that as sort of a non-issue? It's not, it's not a competitor at all. It just won't no, know. no, I, I don't make any such assumption. I mean, that's an, that's an, an empirical question. So, so uh, China is the major rival to the United States. And so it's a dictatorship, uh, a clique of engineers who rules the country uh, in the name of, uh, of, a, of, of a Marxist ideology. In fact, there's no, almost no discussion of Marxism there. If you go to the Central Party School in Beijing, what they spend most of their time discussing is second and third grade texts by American social scientists and policy discourse. There's no discussion of alternatives. But in, in, in the real world, conflict doesn't occur with the best alternative. It, it occurs with the alternatives that are on the table, that are available. And these are the alternatives. Uh, so, it's so it's it's able to do something like mobilize the state to develop artificial intelligence, for example. But it can't develop a national debate. So there's general agreement now, for example, that China has to shift its focus from an export-led style of production to deepening of the internal market. But the deepening of the internal market isn't a trivial accounting move. It requires radical redistribution among sectors, among regions, and among classes within China. So it's inherently conflictual and explosive. And the question is, how can China then manage it unless it can establish a national conversation, a national debate? So its authoritarian bias radically limits its ability to engage the problem. Uh, so that's the real rival. So we're not dealing with these hypothetical rivals. We're dealing with the things that actually exist. 
and the things that actually exist are all radically defective. Yes? So you had mentioned the course focuses on the political economy, but I'm just curious on your thoughts of whether or not cultural zeitgeist will uh, remain a barrier to the kind of market reformulation that you were discussing, or if you think that the market reformulation will cure the focus that currently exists on the cultural zeitgeist. Well, you have to say some more about what you mean by the cultural zeitgeist. I guess um, just kind of like the mainstream political debates on culture wars and cultural issues like um, you mean like identity politics or the opposite of it or something? Yeah, I suppose. Um, yeah. Kind of like the right's focus on LGBTQ rights and stuff like that. Well, this is way beyond the horizon that I intended for this course. But uh, <laughs> what I would say is that um, the failure to address the the structural issues of society then leads to a, a series of evasions, uh, and which we which we see all the time. So uh, there is no project in these societies that addresses effectively the sense of dispossession, of abandonment of the working class majority of the country. The white working class majority in, in the United States, for example. Uh, and so what are the alternatives that are proposed? The curious thing is that in the United States, the right wing populists and the progressive Democrats have basically the same agenda with respect to the production system. The only difference is with respect to the issue of immigration. But their basic idea is faced with declining mass production industry, the Rust Belt in the United States. What they hope to do is to buy a few more years for it uh, by subsidies, by protection, by prohibitions of offshoring and so forth, rather than having an affirmative project for the conversion of this productive base into another base. That would be a different project. So uh, in, in the absence of projects that, that have to do with the, re the real empowerment of the ordinary person, there are then all of these deflections. And culture then becomes a flight into the Empyrean in which we can negate the real problems of society. Uh, so I think that what one would have to connect the, the issues of consciousness with the material issues. We, we can't treat them as just an escape. And in any real society, the criticism of institutions always has to be accompanied by the criticism of consciousness. So, for example, in the United States, uh, there's a problem of consciousness uh, in which there is a institutional idolatry. The Americans believe that early in the history of their republic, they discovered the definitive form of a free society. And it's enshrined in the Constitution. And the rest of the world must either adopt that formula or continue to languish in poverty and despotism. Uh, and uh, they have simply a reification of the market order. The market is the market. Now, they don't completely believe in that, as I gave the example of the market, of the war economy. When they needed to, they cast it away and they did something completely different. So, what they really think is obviously not simply what they profess to believe. Uh, but if we, w if we are to develop an alternative, we need to do so on every front, and not just in the transformation of practical institutions, but in the criticism and transformation of consciousness. Yes? Fundamental 
challenges as a society for not these specific groups of the knowledge economy you mentioned that actually fare so well. And if they have no incentive to consider these alternatives, then how do we then change? Well, um, so I'm not sure how I, in what spirit I should answer this question. So, so in any, so in any real society, in any one of these real unequal class societies that exist in the world, there's conflict within the elites, and then some faction of the elite sees it as being in its interest to promote a version of the national project, which then allows it to mobilize part of mass opinion. So that's how this distinction between elite and the rest breaks down in actual history. So uh, in the middle of the 19th century, part of the, uh, a, a part of the Japanese elite seizes power, the Meiji Restoration, and they start to reorganize the country. And to reorganize the country, they need broad support. So the elite may see its interest as bound up with the cause of national prosperity and national power. And the promotion of national prosperity and national power in turn may require a change in the, in a larger change in the institutional structure. And that's how it happens. I'm more interested in looking at it, at it not from the standpoint of the elites, but from the standpoint of some agent in society. So take the perspective of what has been the traditional historical constituency of the left-leaning parties in the West, which is the organized industrial labor force headquartered in mass production industry. So they traditionally have a strategy that is purely defensive to build into their niche in the division of labor and protect it against all the threats. So, and they then, def so it's, it, it is, it's an institutionally conservative strategy which assumes that the present organization of the economic institutions and of the production system is the necessary context for the defense of their interests. And it, that institutionally conservative context is related to the inclination to define the groups that are closest to them in social space as their enemies. So the temporary workers, the foreign workers, the small business class are all threats to their interests. Now, they could say, this has no future. Uh, mass production industry is not coming back. So if we are to defend our interests, we can only defend it by converting this exhausted form of production into an alternative. Uh, and to do that, we have to begin to see some of the groups that we defined as our enemies as being, in fact, our allies. So we have to form common ground, for example, with the small business class, the petty bourgeoisie, with the, with, the, uh, uh, with the foreign workers, with the temporary workers. And then we have a more ambitious project of conversion. Now, the political leaders or the union leaders then will always think, and this is, as it were, a principal agent problem, you're asking me to threaten my relation to my traditional base before I have another base, and therefore I'll be left with nothing. So, but if that argument always triumphs, nothing would ever change in the world. So this is then the real stuff of politics. This is how things really happen. But they happen because uh, the content of an interest is never predetermined. So the Marxist idea of class interest is that the broader the scope and the more intensive uh, the conflict, 
the more perspicuous the objective logic of a class interest will be. A class has an objective interest. And as class conflict increases, the nature of that interest becomes clearer. And the punishment for misunderstanding your interest is political defeat. Now, I think that is the exact opposite of the truth. Then what happens is that the sense that a, a class has an objective interest is an illusion which exists in the circumstance of stagnation. The broader the conflict in its scope and depth, the harder it becomes to distinguish the question, what are my interests, from the question, what are the alternatives? And in those alternative forms, who would I become and what would my interest then be? So that's, that's how the discussion of interests merges into the discussion of alternatives. But if we take the position that everyone has an objective interest and no one has a reason to subvert the arrangement that he's in, nothing would ever change. And things do change because of this indeterminacy of interests, because of the relation between the interests of classes and the situation of the power of the state, the prosperity of the state, and so forth. Yes? You'll have to talk louder. Who is the we? No. no. I think every, any real historical circumstance like the one we're in is overdetermined. So there are many reasons for it. Uh, but uh, it doesn't mean that the outcome is a necessary outcome. So the closer you come to the historical situation, the more you see the paradoxes, the contradiction, the opportunities. If we examine historical reality from an ironic distance, it always seems unmovable. But when we examine it from the standpoint of the agent, up close, we see that's not how things are. That everywhere there's contradiction. Contradiction in ideas, contradiction in realities, in, in impulse. So, this is the illusion of passivity, which fades under the discipline of action, of engagement. That's what I think. Yes? Um, going back to your point about kind of the traditional base of the left being eroded or not being as uh, able to be part of class wars and what they originally were able to do, I was looking at a historical example of perhaps like dock workers and factory workers went from a really uh, precarious and low paying field to a middle class position that could afford a job based off of one income. And now there are movements, as you said, in California to have sectoral bargaining for factory workers to impose a statewide, I think, $22 an hour wage uh, with other benefits as well. And looking at the unionization efforts in Starbucks and Amazon and other jobs that we now consider to be perhaps service sector jobs, not tied to the historical industrial labor base, do you think the expansion of perhaps sectoral bargaining to include these types of workers into like a labor movement is a path forward or is that just kind of, you know, kind of like as you said, like it's not kind of creating the opportunity, it's merely giving a fix to the existing system? Do you understand my question? Like, because right yeah. now I think Giving a like it, some people say like if you just give factory workers a good standard of living, you're not transforming the economy. You're merely just I don't know like giving them a 
Well, that, I mean, I don't understand that. That's, that's a kind of maximalism. It says either, so, so every, every real transformation in the world is going to seem inadequate. Look, the, 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 the atmosphere in which we discuss things is an atmosphere in which the idea of transformation uh, from, a, from a left or progressive standpoint is dominated still by the legacy of theories like Marxist theory. So for Marxist theory, uh, there are basically two kinds. There, there's a regime, capitalism, and it's a system. It's an indivisible system. You either replace it or you don't. And what goes together with that is a binary view of politics. There are basically two kinds of political transformation. There's the reformist management of a system, and then there's the revolutionary substitution of one system for another. There's nothing in between. Now, I think that's completely false, because real structural change in the world when it happens is almost invariably piecemeal. And it can become radical if it continues in a certain direction under the aegis of a conception. But when it happens, when it begins, it's always fragmentary. And every partial change can be an excuse not to change more or it can be a provocation to change more. That's the real nature of transformation. And so, uh, Excuse me? No, you can't tell, you, you, you can't tell a priori, you can't tell before. The meaning of a, of, a, of a political event or of a transformation is always determined by what comes next. So uh, will, it, will it then lead you into this other thing? Is it just the beginning of a trajectory? Or is it a way to stop? You, you can't tell that by just examining the movement in itself. It has this plurality of possibilities. But if, you're, if, you're, if your mind is stocked with a broader vision of the possible, you have a tremendous advantage because you're able then to see the range of the possible next steps. And that's what's vital. That's what I believe is the essence of insight. If you don't understand the transformative penumbra of a situation, you don't understand it at all. All you do is register it. That's mystification. That's ex post rationalization. And that's a very large part of contemporary social science and policy discourse. It puts a rationalizing halo on an existing event rather than just trying to understand it as one of the possible manifestations of a phenomenon that could be represented or developed in many other ways. Well, we've we're, we finished, uh, and I look forward with great excitement to our discussion this semester. Thank you.